and join me in welcoming to the show, Rosie. Rosie, what's going on, man? What's happening, man? What's going on? Nothing, man. We're really glad to have you on the show. Uh, a lot of our uh, our readers are kind of curious as to what exactly you have going on right now and, and what are you doing with uh, with life after WWE. Oh, man, just pressing on, really. Uh, kind of just took a month to get, you know, let the uh, independent promoters know uh, that I was free to do some stuff. WWE was cool enough not to put me on the three-month uh, no-compete clause, so I started setting up my deals in Japan and stuff like that overseas. And, oh, nice. um, started work with All Japan last month and been doing a lot of independence down in um, in Kentucky. Oh, cool. Well, what's actually uh, cool about your career is you've been uh, really part of WWE on and off for a very long time, going back to... Uh, I guess the earliest that a lot of people might even remember is when Fat Two was in WWE, and you remember the Samoan Gangsters in ECW uh, stable there, and you guys did a did a little stint. Yeah, I was a year in the business then. I got I got a late start, you know. Um, I didn't go to my dad until so I was about 24 to start wrestling and stuff, and they sent me down to um, Puerto Rico for uh, Carlito's dad, Carlos, and. I worked down there for about eight, nine months, and my uncle called me up one day and said, hey, you got to try out with Big Sam, which is uh, Samu. Mm-hmm. Got to try out with WWE, so we went and did that, and they saw fit to hire us, and... but it was short-lived. Yeah, well, that was, uh, I think you guys actually made uh, only a few appearances. You guys had attacked him after matches. You were at ringside for a while and uh, and things yeah. like that. Yeah, well, we, we basically got on... Um, about a month's worth of house shows and a couple TVs and Vince and uh, my older cousin Samu uh, didn't see some things eye to eye, so we uh, we went ahead and severed our ties and went down to ECW for a little while. Yeah, what was that? What was that like? A lot of people who worked there tend to. Uh... Man, that was insane. I loved that locker room. Oh yeah. That locker room was great. You know, didn't really like the smell of blood the whole all the time, but. Hey, it was definitely a cool experience. You know, ECW was uh, definitely the breakthrough, uh, breakout company, and it was it was a lot of fun working there. Have you had a, Have you had a chance to see any of the the new ECW? I don't know yet. I don't know. We uh, we pitched an email to Tommy Dreamer, and if he decides to, if they decide to call back, they will. But if not, I'm gonna keep pressing with Japan. No, uh, cool, cool. I mean, one of the one of the things too is that uh, I mean, since you've left WWE, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Uh, your partner in Three Minute Warning, uh, Jamal, became Umaga and kind of uh, got a new lease on his career. What what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, I'm good for him. You know, he's got kids just like everybody else, basically. And uh, I wasn't very happy with the way it went um, at first, but. You know, this is the entertainment business, and it is WWE. They're going to do what they're going to do regardless. So, mm-hmm. you know, but he's also my blood and he's my family. So, and, you know, we talk every day, and, you know, he lets me know what's going on. And, I'm, and uh, I'm very happy for him. You know, I just I hope they, they press on a little harder moving forward with his character. I hope they get him out of that Rob Conway, let's beat up everybody from the 80s. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, man. And uh, get him on to moving on to some of the bigger boys because I know he can keep up with them. Well, see, it's funny because when you guys were teaming up, it was kind of along the same boat. I mean, you guys came in the huge, huge splash with, with Eric Bischoff having you attack everybody under the sun, including uh, I think the most memorable was when he had the uh, the lesbians come out, and then you and uh, you and Jamal came out and beat him up. Yeah, that was yeah. No, it that, it started out great. You know, it started out like any tag team dream, and then uh. And then it just fell apart a little bit, you know, here and there. It, there was a crack in the boat. Next thing you know, we started sinking. And it's uh, it happens, you know. That's that's the risk. You, that's the risk you run when you when when you got a partner and 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 you got two people, you know. Sometimes, especially when you're as close as me and my cousin, you forget that you know what one person does affects the other and stuff. And um, you know, the way I see it, everything happens for a reason. And you know, you move on. It, yeah, I, I'm not going to sit around and and cry about what happens. I'm just going to go ahead and fix what. 
Yeah, I think what, what was what was actually most surprising about you guys was that you had hit this this point where it looked like you were about to embark on a on a pretty major feud with Billy and Chuck during the uh, the, the wedding that had gotten all the publicity, uh, and then they just kind of stopped after that. I mean, was there any point where you were saying, you know, uh, you know any, any explanation given to you as to why you didn't go and continue on in this this feud on on the top level? Um, no, no, we didn't. Um, we didn't really get too much feedback from from the office that, you know, I've been around that office for a long time, you know, watching my cousins and my dad and my uncle go through there and stuff. Uh, but no, we didn't, we didn't get too much of an answer, um, except the fact when my cousin called me and told me Johnny, uh, Lauren, I just called him up and released him. And I, you know, that was a shock to me at the same time. And when I called, they said that they had, you know, they had something in store for me that they didn't think, uh, I should uh, be punished for his his little deal, which you know. Bottom line is everybody messes up, but you know if you yeah. get a chance to fix it and move forward, then you, that's what you do. See, well, it's interesting that you bring that up because so many tag teams uh, end up. I mean, there's always that that big kind of stereotype where tag team wrestlers kind of don't get along, uh, and you can kind of look back in history because, as you said you kind of held responsible for what your partner does, but in, in your situation, it's kind of unique because he's actually, you know, is a member of your family. How is that as far as working with a with a family member and, uh, I guess, in a way, mixing personal life with business? Um, well, uh, you, as well as everybody else, should know the family I'm a part of, mm-hmm. so it's not, it's family is mixed with business, and it's always been that way since me and Eki, since me and Yamaga were born. You know, we've been around this business since we were five years old. Well, me five, him three. So it's, you know, it's uh, when you got that many players of your family in the game, then, you know, the game is a part of your family. So everybody understands it and everybody knows what, what the deal is. So, you know, there's, there's just like with what went down, you know, with me and Yamaga supposed, supposed to be teamed back up. Well, didn't work out that way. I'm not going to not going to disown them, uh-huh. you know, that's my blood, I love him to death, and uh, all I can do is support him and, and hope he, he carries that carries that character a long way and gets a good run out of it. Totally. So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, there's, of course, we're, we are a family, probably a little more, <laughs> a little more unique than other families, but I'm sure everybody, everybody's family's got their, their ups and downs, and, and we deal with it. Well, what's up, what separates you guys is that so many times in wrestling, the, the families that are involved in it either have a tragic story or all these, these stories behind them. You think of the Hearts, you think of the Von Erics, you think of families like that. But uh, you guys actually have no real stigma. I mean, there's never been any you know huge blowout, or at least publicly. Um, I mean, what were some of the things that growing up in, in the family you were with, with the industry, that it, the way it is, that, that were kind of instilled in you as far as uh, keeping you guys, uh, I mean, as tight, at least publicly, that people see that you are? Um, oh, shoot. You know, it's, everybody's spread out, so it's not like everybody's down each other's throats. You know, uh-huh. it's Von Eric, they all live in the same town, and this and that, and uh, I, I really don't know. I couldn't tell you that, because, you know, the way I look at it, as I, I take care of what I gotta take care of, and my fam- my cousins, they take care of what they gotta take care of, and somehow, you know, all of our numbers just pop up, and Hey, can you help me do this show? Yeah, sure. You know, hey, let me help you. Just kind of watching each other's back, and it's um, basically not a, uh, we don't carry a love-hate relationship with it, you know, mm-hmm. although it does pop up, but, you know, everything, uh, time heals all over. You separate, like, business and, uh, and personal when you need to. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, everybody has their day in the sun, everybody... Everybody pulls up in the nicer rental car every now and then. You know, somebody's going to have their day sooner or later, so it's pretty much played out by now. <laughs> well, the one, the one main question that, that I've always wondered, and I've wondered it ever since I saw you play in the gimmick on TV, um, when you were first approached about your superhero and training gimmick, how was it explained to you? How was it first brought up? Because I remember, I guess originally it was supposed to be a play on, on words, but what was the what was the concept brought to you as, and, and how was that pitched to you as far as becoming a superhero in training? Um, well, uh, actually.
actually, you know, after they released Jamal, um, I went and sat down with Vince at catering and asked him, you know, let him know that whatever they have planned for me it will be fine enough for me, you know. Mm-hmm. My my whole outlook on on the situation with WWE is, you know, longevity is the key. And, you know, I want to work for that company for a long time. And he had basically told me the uh, what they had in mind, um, courtesy of Brian Gert, mm-hmm. one of the writers. So when they told me the character, I was kind of nervous at first because I spent my whole career, you know, playing a crazy, crazy gangster, crazy Samoan. So it's turning babyface all of a sudden and and actually doing something that's out of my character range, I guess, uh, was, was a, it was a scary thought at first. Um, but then, you know, I called my cousin Rikishi up and talked to him a bit because he had to do the same thing with, you know, with Rikishi. So, uh, he gave me a lot of good advice. He gave me, a, you know, pretty much we, we stayed in contact through the whole deal and, you know, I just basically went out there and just did the best I could with it. And yeah, I mean, well, and, and on a little bit, I believe. You know, it, it start seeing a little bit more people out there with superhero and training outfits and stuff like that. So, so I was pretty much happy with it. You know, and I really dug dealing with the kids with that. You know, that uh, I love, I love helping the kids out like that and stuff. And, you know, they seem to like it, so I, I, I liked it as well. So that's cool. It's actually, uh, we, we had Barry Darso on a, a couple of weeks ago, and he had talked about when he went over from Demolition Smash to becoming the Repo Man, he was able to do a lot more charity work and a lot more things with kids. And I, I guess it, it kind of opens up the new door because, you know, when you're playing the, the three-minute warning, you probably scare, you know, kids in hospitals. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, did you, did you enjoy playing uh, a baby face more? Do you enjoy playing kind of the, uh, the gangster, uh, ass-kicking kind of uh, Samoan gangster? Oh, uh Business wise, yeah, I would I'd take uh I'd take three minute warning with my cousin any day because that was in my heart still it was an awesome tag team. We were we could have very well been right up there with the Dudleys and everybody else and, and the tag team history that follows, you know, with starting with my dad and uncle. But uh you know, not to take anything away from from tagging with Hurricane, I I love that little punk chest. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I, I dug it. 
I really did. Um, no, absolutely. If I had it more seriously, I would have. I would have much rather been in there with with a uh, three minute warning because that would have been a dominant tag team, and mm -hmm. that would have been a proven. That would have been a proven championship versus a uh, five man elimination, five tag team elimination. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the one of the other the things about you guys, about you and Hurricane, that kind of took me for a loop was, I mean, there was never at any point. I mean, to me, my my take on it was always that you had Hurricane who was a superhero, then you had you who who was a superhero as well, but then there was no super villain. Was there ever any talk about bringing in perhaps a foil or maybe even turning you uh, against him at any point? Um, well, there was talks about bringing Gangrel in with uh, Viscera, and that was going to be a team to for us. Um, and then uh, there was talks about me turning on Hurricane. Then there was talks about Hurricane turning on me. Obviously, they went with Hurricane turning on me. Um, but once they sent Stacy over to SmackDown, I kind of I kind of got the feeling that it was the beginning of the end of that. That was the end of it, yeah. Um, which, yeah, because it seemed like they were starting to get with us, um, you know, the office wise starting to get with us with, you know, Stacy and me and Hurricane, but then once they sent her to SmackDown I kinda realized that, you know, this is we're fixing to end this here. Yeah, what well, was sure with, enough, you know, five months later it's pretty much done. So Well with you guys it always seemed like they were gonna uh they were about to pull the the, the plug on, on Hurricane being a baby face. I remember I think it was one summer they had him and he was taking the mask back from the kids and then they forgot about it and then the next year uh, of course during the summer season the hurricanes would come and wipe everybody away and, and here's this baby face named the hurricane and it was kind of seemed like they would be reminded of it you know well maybe we should turn him but it would always seem like they were about to tease it and then they would stop and they would kind of do something else for a while and it, and it took a while to get back to uh to doing anything as far as uh turning one of you guys yeah well that's the, uh that's probably got a lot to do with the pecking order of where we were at in the company at that time. Uh, obviously, there's there were some uh, names that they were pushing a little more, and they were probably concentrating a lot more on. You know, you got well, you got Batista and Orton and Cena, and you know, pretty much the the, the new guys out of my class. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they it's WWE man. It, you know, I've watched them change up a whole show in one day, so it just. It was it was pretty much a a week to week thing on finding out what's going on and and best thing you can do is just pitch our ideas and if they roll with it they roll with it if they don't they don't you know absolutely you know, something else out one thing about wrestling yeah well one of the things I'm getting from talking to you which is uh, kind of surprising because a lot of times you talk to somebody who's been with WWE and then you know left uh, especially somebody who did you know the gimmicks that you did usually they come off very bitter they have a lot of bitter things to say but you seem to have kind of you know your head in a good place and, and you're not looking at it from, from that point of view does that have to do with do you think uh, the way you were raised within the business or, or having people that you know are in your family who have, who have been through similar situations um, as well as you know just watching definitely my family had a big uh, is a big issue with it because I've <clears throat> it's more geared towards that you know you, you understand that it is an entertainment and it, you understand that it is a business mm. you know although you know us as a wrestler might think you you know you can't believe you're getting paid that much money to do that mm -hmm. you know but at the same time it can get it, you can get lost in it and you can you can slowly start letting tables turn on you and if you're not getting that big push or you're not getting the, the type of attention that you think you need, you know, um, <clears throat> with me, it's, you know, I enjoyed working with WWE. They're, they're like my family as well. I've been around them since I was five years old. So, you know, I've, I've, me and, me and Shane McMahon have seen each other on a, on and off basis through the years. You know, growing up, mm -hmm. same age as I am. So, but for the same time, you know, if to push it in there, you know, then it, all you can do is rack your head on trying to make that push get created. And Absolutely. If it's just not your, you know, if it's not in the book for you, then it's not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not ill at WWE. Mm -hmm. You know, I still keep in touch with everybody up there. They're you know, that that was my second family for six years and the years before, you know. Half those agents in there I used to get sodas for when my dad was working with them. That's cool. Not, you know, 
not going to sit there and just all of a sudden be pissed off because I didn't get the brass ring. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think? Too short to be worried about that. I just rather move on and and figure it out, and then maybe if they see fit, then we'll give it another try sometime down the road. Do you think a lot of the a lot of the young wrestlers today uh, kind of come up in an industry where? It's a lot of glitz, it's a lot of glamour, it's a lot of TV exposure that they, they tend to lose sight of the fact that you mentioned that, you know, it is a business and it is the kind of thing where sometimes you make it and sometimes you don't. You think too many people today are ready to become superstars the day they lace up their boots and that kind of contributes to a lot of the bitterness? Um, I, you know, as far as the younger guys, hey, knock yourself out, do what you got to do, but I don't really agree with developmental. Be honest with you. Okay. You know, I was, but that's the old school of me. I was raised up in a day where you had to, you know, you had to grab those older guys' bags, carry them in, and you know, get on the road with them and, and learn the the old school way. And to me, that's that's a lot more creditable towards you as a marketable person in wrestling as if you were ready made. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I think that from what you're saying, too, it's I, I think a lot of these guys, if, if they were to deal with more independent promoters before coming to WWE, they might see that, you know, the WWE is, is maybe uh, not as bad business-wise. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And a uh, quick example, you know, and it, it bears on nobody that, you know, I don't even remember the kid's name, but we're OV, he's at OVW. And, I guess Rip Rogers had a night school going on, and Al Snow told him that, you know, hey, these so-and-so people are going to attend the night school as well. Well, you know, he pulled Al over right next to me and was like, hey, do you think, you know, I don't think I need to go to that. And, you know, I'm doing a lot of wrestling. And I kind of looked at Al, and he looked at me, and I just thought in my head, I was like, man, you know, the WWE's paying you whatever it is they're paying you to learn this craft and you know I, I think a lot of those kids in, in developmental take that for granted oh totally I, you know they just don't understand how they don't know what it is to get on the road 500 miles go make you 50 bucks and take care of that gas and probably steal a candy bar to get back to your own town absolutely so probably there would be a little bit more appreciation. It, I don't know. It's just, I don't. I don't agree with it. It, it. it seems to change a lot ever since uh, you know it's kind of WWE took over a lot of the uh, the territories, and now it, it's becoming the kind of thing where you know they have Deep South and they have OVW, but a, a lot of the guys aren't really learning what it's like to work outside of the the WWE banner, uh, which is you know pretty much a you know a company that that's run like a business. I mean, they've never really dealt with some of the smaller time uh, situations and, and making, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll say a slim few. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not going to say every one of them in, a, in developmental has, you know, is that way because there are a lot of, lot of there's a lot of fresh talent in, in developmental right now. And there's a lot of guys that, that did get out and see the pavement to, to get there, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you do got a select few that that's basically getting the silver tray handed to them right off the bat, and that, and to me, that to me is just slap in the face of the boys that do sacrifice and do get out there and and start registering their bump card early and get it done. You know, doing it the way it should be done. But when you're in WWE, you're you're there. You know, yeah, it's I don't think. Uh, I don't think anybody just moped around and looking at a certain guy saying, oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, F this, F that, you didn't. Yeah. I don't see that happening because once you get up to that point now, they're not worried about where you came from, how you got there. They're worried about what you can do while you're there. Good point. You know, totally. Because the bottom line is everybody gets fed off of who you put in those seats. And, you know, if if, if one guy gets pulled right off of, off of MMA, and he happens to get in the WWE, and he's drawing 5,000 extra seats, then, you know, of course nobody's going to be pissed off if it reflects in their check. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> totally. You know, well, it's it, a give, give thing, give, take, but, you know, I just, that's just something I don't, I, I wish those guys in, in, in develop, I hope those guys in developmental really understand the, the luxury they have of, 
being able to chill out in one spot and, and learning, you know, horning their craft. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, one of the questions that I ask everybody who's on the show, uh, one of the last questions I'll ask you, uh, if you had a choice of anybody throughout wrestling history uh, that you could wrestle, uh, never got a chance to, who would you pick? Hmm. You know what? Probably the mass superstar, man. Oh, yeah? He was always he was always my favorite growing up, you know. And it's kind of weird to say that when you got a family of wrestlers, but, uh, you know, aside of my family, he was, he was one of my favorite. You know, I probably would have really liked working my cousin, you know, Bazuna, too. Ah. He, he just, great big man, a lot, you know, psychology and this and that. And I probably, I, well, I know I would have learned a whole hell of a lot working, working Yokozuna. Well, yeah, he, I mean, he shattered the mold as far as, you know, big man wrestlers. I mean, with, with the amount of time he held, held on to the title in WWE. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, he he carried that he carried that persona about him through every company he worked for and I watched you know, we shared bedrooms together when I was nine years old. Huh. And my dad was teaching him, so I've watched his career very thoroughly through through the years and he uh it was definitely um it was it was a pleasure watching him get in that ring. It's cool, man. Uh, before I let you go, anything you have to say to your, your fans out there who followed you in, in ECW, WWE, and now following you in, in life afterwards? Uh, man, just thanks for hanging on. Keep strong, and uh, don't count me out. I'll be around somewhere. Whether it be Japan, TNA, you'll be able to find me on the Internet. Just punch it in. Totally cool, man. Rosie, thank you so much for being on the show this week, man. All right, man. Thanks a lot.